Well, good evening, church. Let's stand together before we begin worship this evening. God, we just come before you as a body to worship. God, to sing of your goodness, Lord. Just purify our hearts and our minds right now, Lord. Allow us to focus truly on Hosanna in the highest, God, our King, our Lord of Lords. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you came to this place. And we come to worship you like no other. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise as we worship you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. In the trial and the change, 
choose to worship you and honor you. We commit the rest of this evening to you, Father, and ask that you would meet us here, that you, God, would be glorified here tonight. And we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, everyone. You may uh, be seated and turn to your neighbor and give him an air five if you would like. But we just have a few announcements for you before we get into our Bible study this evening. Uh, we just want to remind you through uh, at least the month of June, all of our services are family style. Um, so there'll be no nursery, no kids programming. Uh, all the family will be in here. And so we, we understand, we recognize there's a little more, more noise and movement than what, what we're normally used to. But that's okay. We just invite you to bring your family if you're comfortable and come on down and uh, be part of our Wednesday and Sunday services. Um, next Wednesday night, we're going to have a, a special uh, graduation Wednesday. The service is open for everyone, um, but we're going to take some time and honor all those who uh, have graduated, all those in the class of 2020. Uh, Coach Miller is going to be bringing a special message for them. And so, again, it's open for all, but it's going to be really uh, just geared towards honoring uh, the students and ce celebrating their accomplishments. Um, we won't be taking a, a, an offering. If you've brought a gift, there's some buckets in the foyer. Uh, you can uh, drop your cash or check off there, or you can go to our website, thebridgecc.com, um, click the Give tab, and you can take care of it all there as well. And finally, the last announcement, we're excited to announce that Pastor Chuck 
will be back in the pulpit this Sunday morning. And so we, yeah, he's going to be here live and in person. So come at 8, 9.30, and 11, and uh, celebrate Father's Day with us here as Pastor Chuck brings the good word. Um, well, tonight we have a guest speaker. Mike Scott is going to be teaching us, teaching us this evening. And so I'm just going to pray for him in the study and invite Mike to come on down here. So let's pray. Father, we uh, just thank you for what you've been doing in, in our church through this, this new season of life and ministry. God, uh, we thank you for uh, just moving in, in our hearts and stirring us and uniting us together, Lord, even though we've been this set and apart for, for so long, God. And we just come before you now, God, as we get ready to, to crank open your word and to hear from you. We truly pray, Lord, that you would ready our, our minds and our ears and our hearts uh, to both hear and receive from you. And so we uh, bring Mike before you, Lord, and we ask that you would just speak through him powerfully tonight. And that would just be, Lord, a great evening hearing from, from you. So we give this time to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Phil. All right, there's kids in the house. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm glad you guys are here. Hey, open up your Bibles, if you would, to uh, the book of Mark, chapter 11. I want to talk tonight, um, we're going to focus in on two major themes uh, that are in this, but I'm just going to kind of lead up to it and read uh, some of the first part of the chapter, and but we're going to really hone in tonight on on prayer, and we're going to talk about praying in faith, and then we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about forgiveness, which kind of seems like a, a topic that's that's kind of you know out of the way, or it's kind of a, 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 a some other subject, but it's really not, and we'll find that. And um, so let's just start in Mark chapter eleven, and let's just start in verse uh, seven. Now. Um, before I, before I start here, I just wanted to tell you this, this is a day, this is a day of the triumphal entry. This was a very, very important day in history. Imagine if I was, I called my wife tonight and I said, what was happening 700 years ago? She said, well, that was like Joan of Arc, you know, that was like before the Renaissance. It was right after the dark ages. I mean, it is a long time ago. So imagine if 700 years ago, somebody said, well, um, this guy's going to be born in this certain place, and he's going to, um, he's going to be, he's going to live in this certain place, and, um, and then he is going to walk into the bridge and sit in the front row right there with a the Starbucks um, on this night. And sure enough, there's Joseph. There he is right in the front row with his Starbucks. And 700 years ago, someone said that was going to happen. Well, 700 years ago, um, Daniel and other prophets said that there was a day coming, and this is the day. This was the day when Jesus rode into town on this donkey. He was riding in. He was fulfilling a prophecy that was 700 years old, and right now, we are right at the place where he is getting ready to be crucified, and the covenant is going to change from the old covenant to the new covenant. Everything's getting ready to change. Your Bible has a big, giant cross in the middle of it, and it's right here, and on that side of the cross, the Old Testament side of the cross, we were under an old covenant, under the old law. And when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn and we entered into a new covenant. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that tonight, but I'm just telling you, this was a major, major day in history right here when Jesus rode into town. And so he has his guys go and get this donkey, and so they go and get the donkey, and he gets on it, and, and on, in verse 7 it says, Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We talked a little bit about this on Sunday. We're going to talk a little bit about it, a little bit more about it tonight. And Jesus went in Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So they are, they are walking into Jerusalem, and this is something that they normally did every year. But they're walking into Jerusalem, and they recognize that he is the promised Messiah. And so the people begin to take off their different garments, and they begin to lay them on the ground. And this was something that you would do when a king came into town. 
And, you know, today it's, it's, it would be one thing for us to take off, you know, our jacket or something and put it on the ground for somebody to come and, and to walk by on it on a donkey. But you got to understand in, in these days, you know, your garment was a very special thing. And, and uh, it, you know, you, you see garments in the Bible a lot, but they, they had symbolism. And everybody didn't just have Walmart down the street. They could go down and get a new garment. So if you're going to let somebody's donkey walk around on your clothes, it was going to have to be a pretty important guy sitting on that donkey. Okay? In the Old Testament, if a, if a person was really offended or something, they would rip their garment. And it was, it was really a show that something, that something, a big deal just happened because this guy just ripped his garment. Oh, he's going to have to get that thing sewed back up. Okay? And so he just ruined his garment. And so for people to lay their garments down for, and to have him come in, this was a big deal. So I guess you always knew when a king was coming into town because there was a really confused looking donkey and a bunch of people in their underwear shouting, right? So, so anyway, so this, this was it. This was the most important, um, you know, ascension ever in, 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 the, in the history. And so it says now in verse 12, it says, Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Jesus walks up and he sees a fig tree in the distance. And he says, I'm going to go and maybe find some figs on that tree. Now, there is something very, sim uh, very symbolic going on here about Israel and about the day that he is in. But I want to tell you something that this is, a, this is something that's very significant for us. He walks up to a fig tree, and a fig tree has big leaves. I have a fig tree at my house, and it has big leaves. And the leaves will cover up if there's fruit in there. So when you see it from afar, you're not sure if there's fruit in there. Do you guys think there's fruit on this? No? You think there's fruit on this fig tree? On this fig branch that I'm holding? Can't tell, huh? Look at this. a big old fig in there hiding in there and guess see what it's got on it a little bird a little bird has been chewing on this thing and what happened we had this great harvest of figs and i didn't know it because i looked down at the tree and i didn't see any figs and sure enough those birds were in there they ate like 20 of these beautiful figs and so i missed it but i was just like lord thank you because i'm going to teach on this i just had this happen in my yard where you walk up to the tree and you don't know if there's figs on it yet but look you guys there's actually figs look there's more little figs growing in there. See them all? There's like 10 figs in there, right? Okay. And so a fig tree can be like that. Okay. A fig tree is something that you, you look at. You can see all the leaves, but you're not sure if it's got fruit on it. And you know what? Jesus walked up to this thing and he says, you know what? I came to you looking for fruit. You promised me something uh, that, that would satisfy me. And all you are is show. You're just leaves. And you know what? A lot of us have fig trees in our lives that aren't producing fruit. We've got trees in our lives that are not producing fruit. And you know when you've got one of these because it's something that takes up your resources. It takes your time. It takes up space. It blocks your view. And it's not giving you anything. And it's got a lot of show and a lot of promise, but it's not giving you anything. He's got big old leaves. You can see why Adam and Eve made shorts out of these, right? Because, these, you know, when they, when they had to cover themselves, they had, to, they had some good leaves on a fig tree, right? By the way, these things are itchy. I'm sure they probably were sorry they made shorts out of this. Um, but anyway, that's another story. But anyway, you may, have, you may have fig trees in your life. You may have different things in your life that are promising satisfaction, but they take up space, resources, they're blocking your view and they're all work for you, but they're no pay. You got things like that in your life? Can you think of things like that that are maybe the fig trees that don't, that don't have figs on them? And Jesus says, you know what? You're in my way. You're a distraction to me. I came to you looking for something and there was nothing there. And Jesus wants to get these distractions out of our, out of our view. And we're going to find tonight as we talk about prayer that often Jesus is talking about getting things out of of our way and out of our life when we're praying. Say to this mountain, move. Say to this tree, be uprooted and thrown into the sea. He was casting out demons. He was casting out sickness. He was often getting things out of the way through prayer. And that's where we're heading. 
So it says in verse 15, it says, They came to Jerusalem, and then Jesus went into the temple, and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And he taught them, and, 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 and I'm sorry, then he taught, saying to them, it, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teachings. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. Jesus comes into the temple and he says, You guys have lost focus. You forgot what my house was about. My house was a place for people to come and connect with me. A place for people to come and connect with me. And how do you connect with God? Through prayer. So he says, I want people to come to my house. I want them to pray there. And tonight, I, I want to spend some time praying. As I look at this group here, I, I was going to come tonight and speak about some of the hang-ups and things that are in our own lives. But many of us here love the people around us. And we have people that we see who, who are in our families and who are in our workplace and neighbors and people who God has put into our lives. And we're carrying these great burdens for them. And I want to talk tonight about, what, about, about praying for others. I want to talk not so much about our hang-ups, but how do we help others with their hang-ups? How do we help others when they have these huge, huge things in front of them? And so I want to focus the rest of our time tonight just on verse 20 through 26. It says, In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now, I want you to catch this. This is the first thing he says to them. They said, Jesus, how in the world did you do that? And he says, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So Jesus spoke to this fig tree. It dried up from the roots and it died. Immediately, it died really instantly. And, and a miracle happened. I had this happen right in my yard. And that's why this big thing is sitting out in front of you here tonight. This thing is heavy. We had a huge tree. And it is a, um, a Palo Verde. And you can buy one of these cursed things. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you can buy one of these things at um, Home Depot for like $130. But I had one just spring up in my yard, right? And it was being fed and fertilized by the septic tank at my house. And I never watered that thing. I didn't have to because it was tapped in, right? Well, what happened was this thing got like 50 feet tall. It had all kinds of, um, what's that stuff you hang at Christmas and you kiss under it? Uh, mistle, it had mistletoe all in it, birds all living in it. It was a huge monstrosity. The, the, I mean, it's huge. This is just a piece of it. What happened was we changed the septic tank. We had to change it and we, cha and we, we, we re reverted it or whatever. And we dried up the source. And little did I know that the roots under this tree dried up. And a big wind came, and that sucker came down and fell right in the middle of my backyard. Could have landed right on the house, but it, it fell by God's grace right over. It went right through a fence, and it just laid there for months because I didn't know what to do with it. It was so big. And as I started to chop this thing up and look into it, I realized the roots under it were dead. They were, they were, they were kind of chalky, and just they weren't, they weren't real vibrant. And I realized the roots had died up. And I thought, you know what? The, the water that was feeding is no longer feeding it anymore. Do you know how to get rid of the fig trees in your life that are not producing? Cut the water off to them. Cut off your resources. Cut off the time you're giving to them. 
If you're, if you're looking at a video game all day long and it's just taking your life away from you, just cut it off. There may be something that is just sucking the life out of you. Cut it off. Cut off the water to it and it'll die from below and, you'll, and you won't know what's happening under the surface. But eventually that thing will fall and it'll be out of your life. So I want to talk to you about this thing right here because this, this thing fascinated me and I want to talk about it tonight. This is actually a root from that tree. This is not a branch from that tree. This is a root. So after the tree fell over and we drug that thing off, there was this much sticking out of the ground right here, just right where the chain is hooked onto it. That much was sticking out of the ground. And I said, man, I got to get these roots out. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll get my shovel out. <laughs> I'm going to start digging down and getting these roots out, right? And I realized I'm not going to be able to get this root out by myself. So what I did was I took my work truck. I have a work truck, and it is a, it's a great truck. I asked my boss if I could do this. And I hooked this chain up to the top of that root. And I said, Joel, just watch and see what happens. I'm going to back this truck up and see if it'll pull that root out. I had no idea what I was getting ready to pull out of the ground. And man, I just backed that truck up. And Joel said the whole ground just kind of lifted up. And this thing came out of the ground. And we were standing out there looking at it. We can't. It took Phil... Joel, Ben, and me to carry this thing in here tonight. It is solid. It is so heavy. That's just a root. And I just thought, this is an amazing analogy. And then I went and I realized there were other roots there. And so I began to pull them out. I probably pulled 20 roots. Not this big. This was the big one. And we're going to talk about the big one tonight. But we pulled this thing out. We, we pulled all these roots out. And I would just hook that truck up to it. And the truck never labored. The truck would just pull them right out. I was astonished by three things. And that's what I want to talk to you about. One was the size of the root. I mean, look at it. it I broke it off. There was more down there. I broke this thing off 10 feet down in the ground. The size of the root was amazing to me. And some of the things that are going on in yours and my life and in our families, they're bigger than we think they are. And we kind of think that we can handle them. Let me just get my little shovel out and just kind of dig on this thing every day. Man, I'd be digging until all my kids were grown. If I was to just trying to get this one root out. I was astonished at that. But what I was also astonished at was how strong that truck was. I had no idea. I've been driving that truck. I've been sitting in the passenger, or I'm sorry, in the driver's seat of that truck for like five or six years. I had no idea it had that power. It's kind of like my iPhone. I think I could probably, you know, do, I do so many wild things. I could probably like, you know, I don't know what I could do with that thing. All I know how to do is make telephone calls on it and text. I have no idea what the, what the real you know, measure of what, what I can really do with that iPhone is. Some of you guys know, but I have no idea. And that truck was so strong, I was so amazed that it didn't even labor. It just went and just popped, the, popped this thing out. But one other thing I was totally amazed at was the strength of the chain. I could not believe this chain didn't break when I pulled that thing out of the ground. So you got a problem, and you got the power of God. So how do you connect the power of God to your problem? It's another P word. It's what you do in the house of God. It's pray. You pray. We connect the power of God to the problems of people around us and problems in our life and in our family, things we cannot deal with. Some of us have generational things that our family has learned and we've gone through over and over, year after year. And we have just are in a mindset of depression or a mindset of just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose again. It's not gonna work. We're just in a mindset that we can't get out of and it's deep and it goes way deep down and maybe it goes years back. And God says, I can pull that out of the ground. I can pull it. Just, just hook it up. Just hook it up. 
I'm not, I won't strain when I pull that thing out of the ground, but I want you to hook it up. That's all you've got to do. And sure enough, all I did was I just took the front of this, I hooked it up to the truck, and I walked over and I hooked it up to that, and the air conditioner was blown and the radio was playing. I put it in reverse, and that thing popped right up out of the ground. It wasn't that hard to do, but I had to engage. And Jesus says right here, he says, listen, listen, to, all, listen to how he's talking about us. In verse 23, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. He's saying, I want a relationship with you. Some of us are saying, God, why aren't you moving in this world? He's like, hook me up. Why aren't you doing something about the problems out there, God? Hook me up. I want to have a relationship with you. You are the connection between the problem and the power. And all I'm asking you to do is pray. All I'm asking you to do is just hook up the chain. So some of you say, well, I've been praying and nothing's happening. Well, I want to go back to what Jesus said. He said, have faith in God. Now, what Jesus is saying is that when you hook up, hook me up to your problem, your faith is small. You have little faith. Faith was the problem with Jesus, with his disciples. It wasn't the problem with Jesus, but that was, that was a problem he was having with his disciples, is that they didn't have faith. And when people would come to them, he would say, he, was, he would marvel. There was two times that Jesus marveled in the Bible. Like Jesus himself was astonished. One time was because somebody's faith was so great. And the other time was because the faith was so dull and so weak in the place. Those were the two places he marveled twice about faith. One because it was great and one because it wasn't. And some of us, we're just praying like, oh, Lord, bless me. Oh, Lord, bless that person. Oh, Lord, bless that person. And we're just kind of saying words, but we really have no belief and understanding that God's going to do it. We have no, we really don't think he's really going to pull that chain. We don't even think, we're not, we're just doing what we're supposed to do. Well, I, man, I pray every day. But you know what? How do you get, what is this chain made out of? What is strong faith made out of? Strong faith, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and how do you hear? You hear by hearing the Word of God. Now, some of you are saying, okay, then I just need to read my Bible more. Yes, you do. But I want you to, I want you to do something. I want you to, to see this in a, in a bigger light. God wants to have a relationship with you. And so he has a relationship with you through his word, but he wants to talk to you specifically through this word. He has a word specifically for your situation, and it comes through prayer and time with him that you're going to know, you know what, that word's for me. I want to give you an, um, a, uh, a, a definition of faith. It's conviction, confidence, trust, belief reliance, trustworthiness, and persuasion. That, that is what faith is. Some of you guys know that my daughter uh, got married here just a few months ago, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a, an emergency wedding um, because they were supposed to get married a week later, but the whole country was shutting down. And so Pastor Chuck said, let's do it at 9 o'clock at night. Some of you were there. It was fantastic, right? So I call Phil. And Phil, hey, um, something's going on here. You know, we're going to be having a, a wedding in four hours. And I remember, I remember Phil said this. He says, I got this. And you know what I did? I hung up the phone. I put my feet up on my couch. And I just started texting people. Hey, come to the wedding. There's a wedding happening. I wasn't spinning around. I wasn't worried about it. Because I have, I have a relationship with Phil that every time Phil does something, it gets done. When Phil says, I got this, it just gets done. Hey, Phil, can you put a picture up on the screen? Oh, yeah, I got it. Hey, can you show this movie? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Hey, can you do this? Oh, yeah, I can do that. 
Hey, Phil, can you help me? Oh, yeah, I'm there. And I have, a, I have faith in this person because I've spent time with them. And every time he says, I got this, he's got it. And when he said, I got this, I just said, okay. And I didn't do anything. I just showed up for the wedding. It was great. I wasn't spinning around nothing because I hooked up to the right guy, right? <laughs> okay. So now imagine that with God. How many of you feel like God says to you, I got this? I mean, how many of us are that close to him where he says, I got this? I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about having this relationship with God through faith. Because when you, when you talk about faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and it starts to talk about all these men of faith. What does it say? Noah built an ark when God warned him. It says Abraham left his land when God called him. Sarah believed she was going to have a baby when God promised it to her. Those aren't verses in the Bible. They didn't, Abraham didn't look and say, oh yeah, it says right here in Psalm, you shall go to Ur, you know, or you shall go to Canaan. He didn't say right here in Psalm 11, whatever, you know, Sarah shall have a baby. No, God was speaking to these people and they were hearing him and they were in relationship with him. I would encourage you to pray with your eyes open. And here's what I mean. Take the word of God and take that situation you've got. Maybe you've got somebody in your family who's on drugs or you've got a, a marriage that's breaking apart. Or you've got somebody who's, who just needs help and you don't know how to help them. Before you just say, oh Lord, help. Sit down and pick up the word of God and say, God, do you have a word for me from your word for this situation? And God may have a specific verse that was written 6,000 years ago that's for you right now, today. He wants to be in relationship with you. And he's not going to get outside of the confines of, his, of, 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 of any moral laws or anything like that. But I'll tell you what, it is a wide open relationship with God. I wanted to just give you an example. I've had a few in my own life. I just want to give you an example tonight. That same wedding, Joseph and Sarah read in their Bibles and pray into the Lord about if they should get married and when they should get married. Just bringing it before God, putting it on the table, bringing it before God. And Joseph is in the Song of Solomon. He's reading the Song of Solomon. And these verses in Song of Solomon are talking about the spring. The springtime has come. And, and the flowers are in bloom and all these different things. It's just a really neat poetic thing written back in Solomon's time. And he calls Sarah... And they're talking to each other. And Sarah had the same verses, the same ones. So they begin to pray and they begin to realize God is speaking to us through his word. They were praying with their eyes open. I, was, I began to pray, Lord, what do you want to do? Is this, is this, the, is this the person for my, for my daughter to marry? What do you want to do with this young man? Who is this young man, Joseph? And should I, is, should I bless this? Should I go forward with this? What do you want me to do with this? And I, at that time, I was praying through the Psalms. And right at that time, I get into Psalm 80 and Psalm 81. And I, I, let me just read you this, just one verse. This is just part of my testimony. But it, it says, um, Psalm 80, verse 1. All right, I just like, Lord, what do you want to do here? Psalm 80, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, really? You know? And, and so I didn't just like jump up and say, there's the word from the Lord. But then the next day it comes up again. And it comes up again. And it comes up again. And you begin to realize God is speaking. God is speaking. God wants to talk to us. He wants to have a relationship with you. That's why he always brings it down to the lowest level. He says you don't have to be a professional Christian. You can be a little kid praying on the side of your bed. And God will speak to you. When I was your age, I said, Mom, will God speak to me through the Bible? She said, sure. And so I picked up my Bible and I opened it up. And it was um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It was the only verse I knew in the Bible. And I knew when I was a, a little kid like your age that God had spoken to me. I knew that that was for me 
at that time. And on and on and on and on that has happened in my life and in many of your lives. You have testimonies of times that God has spoken to you. So when you have a word, you have faith because you have the word of the Lord. Now you hook that up and you say, Lord, I've got a word from you. I know the direction that you want to go. You have shared it with me. Jesus, what does he say? He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. It's the same thing. He's saying, abide in me. Pray with your eyes open. Watch and see what's going on out there. You know, when it says in, in Romans, it says, um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you read further on there, it's talking about Psalm chapter 19. And Psalm chapter 19 says, um, it's talking about all of nature and everything that God has made and all of it is speaking to us. It says, your song has gone out to all the earth. It's not just talking about ink on paper. It's talking about everything that is around you and the God who lives inside of you and wants to have a relationship with you. And so now you come to your prayer closet and you say, Lord, I've got your word, and I know what your word says about this. So when somebody comes to you and says to you, man, I'm just dealing with, with heaviness, I'm just with this, this depression, what do you say to them? You, said, you say, God, in his word, says, I will give you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. I will give you the oil of joy for mourning. And if you know the word, you're going to have more faith. If not, you're going to say, oh, Lord, help them carry that heavy burden of depression. I sure hope it leaves them someday. No, you don't do that because you have God's word in you. And you, know, you now know how, what you're hooking up to. You know that, that root of, of, um, of you know, depression and heaviness is not something that God wants in that person's life. I'm hooking it up because I got the word of God. I have faith now that says that person is not supposed to be dealing with depression. So now I got a strong chain and I hook it up to a strong God and it picks up a strong root that I couldn't have got out of there myself. Jesus wanted to give us the power to pray with power and the ability to pray with power. And that comes through faith. Some of us don't have a lot of faith. And you know why? Because we don't have a lot of the word of God. We're not walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to talk about one big root because this big root show, keeps showing up in the Bible. It's very interesting. It just kind of seems like Jesus changes the subject. But remember after he taught them, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, um, who are indebted to us and and for yours is the kingdom and the glory. Remember what he talks about right after that? He says, for if you do not forgive those who have wronged you, then neither will I forgive you. You know, when Jesus breathes on the disciples after he's raised from the dead, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you know what he starts to talk about right after that? Forgiveness. He begins to tell them, I am now putting you into a new covenant where you can let people go. Because there are roots of unforgiveness that are, that are tied to everything else in your life. And so sure enough, right here, Jesus gives this big thing, this big lesson on prayer. And then he goes right on. And he says, and whatever you, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, there are two things that we've talked about often here, and I just want to hit them briefly tonight. The Bible says that if you bring your offering to the Lord, let's say you come in, you're going to come in, you're going to pray and worship the Lord tonight, and you know that somebody has something against you, leave that place, go out, make the phone call. It doesn't say that in the Bible, of course, but, you know, go find that person, be reconciled to that person, make the phone call. Go grab them and say, man, can I talk to you? I need to talk to you. If they're in church and take them out or go or just leave, drive over to their house, do whatever you need to do before you bring your offering and make it right with them. 
And the reason is because you, as much as is humanly possible, have the ability to possibly set that person free of the bitterness or whatever they're having against you because you've offended them. So you're holding the ball, okay? So, you, so it says if someone has an offense against you and you know it, go fix that. Don't come, don't, I, don't, I don't want you in church that night. I want you there fixing that thing. And then bring your offering to me. But forgiveness is the other side. Forgiveness is when somebody has offended you. And now you come into church. Now you're coming into the place of prayer and you're offended and they haven't come to you. In fact, they're sitting like three rows over and you're like waiting for them. You know, I just read in the Bible, you're supposed to come to me. You know, you've offended me and we're supposed to get this right so I can get on with this worship. Forgiveness is different. When it's an offense against you, you can forgive and you can deal with it right there before you and God and you don't need to deal with it with that person. You don't need to go and tell that person you forgive them for what they did to you. You ever tried that? You ever tried to go to someone and just say, hey, you know, you probably don't know, but you're a real jerk and I forgive you. You know, I tried that once. I did. I, just, I was carrying this, this unforgiveness in my heart. Something happened in high school. And like five years after I got out of high school, I was still mad at this guy. Finally, I called him. He was at Pepperdine University. And I said, hey, man, I just want to tell you I forgive you. And he's like, what? For what? You know? And I was so embarrassed. And I realized I just was trying to deal with something in my heart. I didn't know how. I was a Christian. I didn't know how to deal with it. But God was saying, forgiveness on your side, you can deal with it right here, right here with me. So when you stand praying, you can say, Lord, I'm hurt by that. But would you take that unforgiveness out of my heart? Would you take that bitterness, that root that is going so deep, will you take that out of my heart? Because, man, I'm just tied to this thing. It's just, it is so deep. I can't get it. Every time I hear that person's name, I'm just upset and I just can't think a good thought about them. In fact, that's how you know if you haven't forgiven somebody. When their name comes up, what are you thinking? Right? You know it, right? Now we're all like, oh, yeah, that's right. I do have some unforgiveness in my heart. I was doing this exercise on my way down here tonight. I was like, Lord, is there anyone? You know? And it, sure enough, there was. You know, and I didn't know. And, but you just, you just have to realize, man, there's a, there's a root. And you got to deal with it. So sure enough, I just, you know, just just got over it. Just, just dealt with it. But you can do, deal with forgiveness between you and God. You get that? If there's been somebody who hurt you in, their pa in the past, what if they died? Or what if they live, you know, far away? Or what if they won't get together with you? Do you have to hold that in your heart? No, you're not bound to it. So when you have it in your ability, you just forgive. And God will just, you hook that unforgiveness up to God and you say, Lord, I want you to pull this out of my heart. And he'll pull it up and it'll come right out. And you know what? You might find that it still tries to linger. Some of you have gone through some very horrible things and have had to deal with that, have had to deal with, the, with, with how you feel when you think about that person. But if you have made a decision to forgive somebody, you know that it gets easier as you go along. And eventually you find yourself praying for that person and actually loving that person and wanting them to know the Lord. And you'll know that that forgiveness has been dealt with. Jesus always went to that. He always dealt with forgiveness. He always dealt with, with, with the bitterness in our hearts whenever he talked about prayer. So if you're, if you're hindered in your prayer, it may be because your faith is small or you may have some unforgiveness that God, he doesn't want to talk about anything else until you get that dealt with. Okay? So do we have to, um, we have, to have real long and um, spiritual prayers when we pray? Or can we just say, God help me? You know, these kids, they said this, Hosanna, that just means save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That means, that means we love the king. And blessed is the kingdom. We love his kingdom. Lord, save us. We love you. And we love it when you're the king. We love it when you're on the throne. We're in a mess here. Lord, just save us. And he did. And he will. You don't have to have these long prayers. Kids, you can just kneel on the side of your bed every night and say, oh, Jesus, help me. And he will listen to you and he will answer your prayers. He wants to talk to you. I got a quick story and then I'll be done. Um, Max Lucado uh, has a book called And the Angels Were Silent. And 
I just, I just really like this book. And um, let me see. It says, one of my favorite stories concerns a bishop who was traveling by ship to visit a church across the ocean. And while en route, the ship stopped at an island for a day. And he went for a walk on a beach, and he came upon three fishermen mending their nets. Curious about their trade, he asked them some questions. Curious about his ecclesiastical robes, they asked him some questions. When they found out he was a Christian leader, they got excited. We Christians, they said, proudly pointing to one another. The bishop was impressed, but cautious. Did they know the Lord's Prayer? They had never heard of it. Uh, what do you say then when you pray? We pray. We are three. You are three. Have mercy on us. <laughs> the bishop was appalled at the primitive nature of the prayers. That will not do. So he spent the day teaching them the Lord's Prayer. The fishermen were poor but willing lear learners. And, and before the, bis the bishop sailed away the next day, they could recite the prayer with no mistakes. The bishop was proud. On the return trip, the bishop's ship drew near the island again. When the island came into view, the bishop came to the deck and recalled with pleasure the men he had taught and resolved to go see them again. As he was thinking, a light appeared on the horizon near the island. It seemed to be getting nearer. As the bishop gazed in wonder, he realized the three fishermen were walking toward him on the water. Soon, all the passengers and crew were on the deck to see the sight. When they were within speaking distance, the fishermen cried out, Bishop, we come hurry to meet you. What is it you want? asked the stunned bishop. We are so sorry. We forget lovely prayer. We say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then we forget. Please tell us prayer again. The bishop was humbled. Go back to your home, my friends, and when you pray, say, We are three. You are three. Have mercy on us. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> God wants to be in relationship with us from the youngest children in here to the oldest of us who have been in the faith for some time. He wants to be in that relationship with us and he does it through his word, but he also does it through his word to us specifically and personally. If you've got problems that are big, hook them up to the power, okay? We're the ones. We just hook it up. That's all we do and God does all the pulling and he does all the the hard stuff. Okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you tonight for your word. I just thank you that we have the Bible. And it is so full of life. It is truly living. And when we read it, it gives us life. I pray that every child in this room would fall in love with your word. And they would know you. We pray for each child in this room that they will be more devoted than we ever were. That they will hear you with ears the way we never heard you. They will see you with eyes like we never saw you. And that in their simplicity, they would move mountains. Because they trust you, Lord. And we want to be like that. Right now, all over this room, every one of us probably has something so big that we don't even feel like we can pray for it. We just feel like it's just so far-fetched that there's no way we could pray for it. That person is so far gone, that relationship is just so damaged that there's just no way it can ever be fixed. Some of us have people we're trying to help, but we have no clue how to help them. Lord, right now, we just... All of us, we just hook up to your power. We just hook that problem to your power right now. Just in this room right now, just take some time and just pray. Pray for that person you've been afraid to pray for. Pray for that situation that you just have felt was just too far gone. Let's just take a couple minutes while Scott plays and let's just pray.
Now, some of you have uh, things that you're praying for, but you don't know what God wants to do. You're not sure the direction that he wants to take. I want to encourage you. I want to just equip you with this. to Take your Bible this week and just start reading it. And read it with this person, with this situation in mind. And see if God will not just speak to you and just give you some encouragement through that. God is seeking people who are seeking him. He's looking for people who are looking for him. And I just pray that everybody in this room would just draw closer to Jesus, would begin to hear his voice better. Just stay in a place of prayer as we, as we close out tonight, as Scott plays, as they finish with this song. Just sing it to Jesus and just worship him and just go out of this place tonight ready to go into prayer and to see mountains move. Jesus, we thank you. We give you honor tonight. And we just want, we just want so much to be where you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray tonight, Lord. Amen. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, your love. Understand that the power is in your precious and holy name, Jesus, our God, our King. You are our source. You are our strength. You are God, and you love us. And no matter what we face, whatever we go through, let us never forget your love, that it never runs out on us. And all we can do is run to you in power through prayer to overcome the circumstances and the problems in our life, Lord. God, we bless you, we praise you, and we're singing out. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Let's stand and sing that. Your love never fails, never gives up, it never runs out on me.
your love. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence, your power, your spirit, Lord, living in us. God, we worship you. We praise you. We bless your holy name, Jesus. We love you. Amen.